a great race was planned, and they had two teams that each had nine people on it. The first team was what we'll call the wise team. The wise team won. The other team that we'll call the foolish team, they hired an expert to find out what went wrong. Here was what he reported. The wise people had one person steering the boat and eight people rowing while the foolish team had eight people steering and only one person rowing. Aha, said the foolish people, immediately restructured their team. Now they had one senior manager, seven management consultants, and one rower. This time the wise team won by two miles. They did further intensive consultations and realized what they had to do. The foolish people fired the rower. Sounds like a subcommittee of Congress, doesn't it? Today we start a whole new series that we're calling Wise Up. Wisest man in history was King Solomon, David's son. And, of course, the famous story is when God said to him, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And so instead of asking for anything else, he just asked God to give him wisdom. And God said to him, because you have asked for such a profound, wise thing, I'm going to do that for you, but I'm going to bless you in so many other ways. And God did. And as we go through this series, I want us to think about wisdom because you would think, okay, Solomon became wise. God blessed him for it, and they all lived happily ever after, right? The problem was that in spite of his wisdom, Solomon did not check his emotions and his sensual desires against the wisdom. In other words, he allowed what he wanted to become more prevalent in what he chose than the wisdom he had been given. And just an example, in his life, he had 700 wives at the same time. And just in case that wasn't enough, he had 300 in those days what were called concubines. They were live-ins that he wasn't actually married to. But he was still fully engaged in relationship with them. Most men can't manage one wife. But hopefully we're smart enough. <laughs> I saw that. Hopefully we're smart enough to know that we're blessed if we are married and we have a wife, especially a godly wife who also has wisdom. And you've been around here any length of time, you know that a lot of what bails me out of a lot of things is I'm married up. But I want us to look at these weeks. If Solomon was the wisest man and he still didn't live as well as he could have from the wisdom, what can we learn and how can we truly live from God's wisdom in our lives? How can that really play out in a powerful way for us to be everything God has called us to be and wants us to be and wants us to live life. And so these weeks, we're going to talk about different aspects of what it means to wise up. Our, our central text that will guide us through this whole time comes from the book of Proverbs, much of which Solomon himself wrote. Uh, chapter 2, verse 6, wisdom is a gift from a generous God, and every word he speaks is full of revelation and becomes a fountain of understanding within you. 
And so starting out this series, we're going to talk about this theme and concept today of what does it mean to walk in wisdom, that God has called us to walk in His wisdom. And our theme verse for today is from the same book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 7. We cross the threshold of true knowledge when we live in obedient devotion to God. Stubborn know-it-alls will never stop to do this, for they scorn true wisdom and knowledge. Have you ever met somebody who knows it all? If there's any subject you ask, they have an answer for you. And uh, in their mind, their answer is right. And if you disagree with them, you're wrong. Have you, ever, have you ever met anybody like that? Have you ever looked in the mirror and seen that person? <laughs> it's very important that we learn to live this life where we walk in God's wisdom, not our own. And so I want to look at several things that are components of what will let us clearly walk in God's wisdom and not make the mistakes that Solomon made. The very beginning one for us is actually, of course, knowing Jesus in our life, but in then living that out, that's it, I'm taking that for granted that you understand that this morning, that you anchor in a full gospel, biblical worldview community. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware that no one distracts you or intimidates you in their attempt to lead you away from Christ's fullness by pretending to be full of wisdom when they're filled with endless arguments of human logic. For they operate with humanistic and clouded judgments based on the mindset of this world system and not the anointed truths of the anointed one. That verse is critical for the world you and I live in because so much of what we do today ends up being based on human understanding and knowledge and frequently human understanding and knowledge of the Word of God is what many, many churches and many organizations that call themselves spiritual, they build their theological perspectives more on human reasoning than they do on centralizing the Word of God. And so it's important if you and I are going to serve God that we find a place that we can become a part of a family where that particular group of people embrace the truth of God's Word at face value understanding. In other words, if God's Word says something is pretty likely that's what he meant. If you read somewhere that the sky is blue and you look up, unless it's a cloudy day, you're going to have confirmation of what you read. But if it's a cloudy day, you may look and say, no, the sky's not blue, it's gray. Because the perception of the moment appears to be gray, but the truth is, once the clouds go away, what color is the sky going to be? Blue. Unless you live in Los Angeles or some other place that has a lot of haze over it. But blue is the basic color. That's a truth that you can count on. The same thing is true with God's Word. Frequently, we want to over-interpret God's Word. And one of the challenges we have is that the Word of God, as you and I read it today, is not from original manuscripts. It, it's really uh, interesting when you go to Israel, and, uh, and, and we actually had some opportunity the last time we were there to go into museum in Jerusalem where they literally have some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they actually had on display that day from the book of Isaiah. And uh, that's far closer to original manuscript of the written Word of God than what you and I have in our current translations and even sometimes what are paraphrases. Doesn't mean that they're a bad thing. I am so thankful for Craig Groeschel and the vision of uh, the church he pastors that shared with the world the Version Bible. 
because it's a wonderful tool that's available to you online. And what I like about it is if I'm reading something from God's Word and I want to just fully understand it, I can look at multiple translations of the exact same verse and it brings clarity to me. I love, and, and frequently you'll hear me read from the message. But I'm careful when I read from the message, and here's why. Because the message is not an actual translation, it's a paraphrase. In other words, it's what some brilliant people, who I believe were overall very godly people, actually sat down and they put together a way of, how can we say this where it's very understandable? So they took translations of the Bible and they just began to paraphrase it so that it's in easy to read language. Where you have to be careful is sometimes it can be slightly slanted because it is a paraphrase. And so I go in reading that knowing that. But what I do know is that there is great understanding. And because I don't have the capability of, of going in and reading in Greek or Hebrew, if I want to know in as easy a way possible, what is the closest way to read what would be close to what the original Greek and Hebrew would have been, then the Amplified Version is a great way to do that. Because the Amplified Version kind of gives you a whole wheelbarrow load of, of information about each verse. Because it gives you the possible shadings of what that can mean. And yet, at the end of the day, if you read all those different translations, the gospel is the same. Gospel doesn't change. And our understanding of it becomes based on that clear sense of knowing the sky is blue. If God said it, that settles it. Growing up, I heard it said as a kid, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, it's simpler than that. God said it, that settles it. What you do with what you believe about it is your issue, not God's. So it's important that we are involved in a family of believers who have God's Word at face value as the priority of who we are. A number of years ago, I was at a community event that was held in one of the downtown churches that's from a very, what we would call liberal perspective of a mainline church. I shouldn't tell you this, but I was bored. And so while the service was going on, I was sitting toward the back and there was nobody further behind me. So I took one of their hymnals out and just kind of started looking at it. And it was fascinating to me because they had scriptures in that hymnal on the back of it that were totally the Word of God. But that church in practice doesn't believe the authority of the Word of God. So even though it's sitting there in those hymnals in their pews, what comes out of the platform and what is lived out by the people of that church is not at all biblical Christianity. And I won't tell you what church it is. I'll just tell you that that is true in a good number of mainline churches in the world we live in today because it's become far more about man's traditions and social values than it has been the Word of God being the anchor that you depend on. And so it's important that when you look and say, I want wisdom in my life, to realize this, we are not called to live in isolation. We are called to live in community with other believers. We are the body of Christ. Jesus is the head of the church. But we are the church, and literally, we are not meant to be, if you're a hand, you're not meant to be out here just flopping around with no connection to the rest of the body. We were made to be connected fully and embrace being a part of the body of Christ, and so it's very important that we do that. And, and here's the view that becomes important, and, and this goes back to the series we just did uh, on, on the solid rock, is that we see see the world clearly through a redeemed by grace perspective of Jesus so that we indeed look and we see everything about the word of God points to Jesus 
Everything in the Old Testament points toward the need for Jesus to come. Everything in the New Testament is either about what happened when he was here or points back to what happened because he came. And he is weaved through all of that because he was in the beginning with God and he was active throughout all of the history that's recorded in the Word of God. So we begin to understand this. I look and my life focuses on the Word of God. Jesus is that living Word of God. He is my Savior. He's the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He's the healer. He's my soon coming king. And so I engage with a community of people who believe those truths. And then stay directly connected to that church family that shares the full gospel biblical view. And by that I mean this. I was raised in an environment that we believed that a lot of what happened in the books of Acts didn't happen anymore. That that went away with the age of the apostles. And uh, I, I began to realize maybe there was something we had missed. And I've come to know this. Jesus really is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if it happened in the book of Acts, it can happen today. That's what it means to be full gospel. It means that the word of God never changes and that anything that's ever happened that God's ever done can still happen now and is likely to happen now. And so that becomes the basis for us having a community that we get engaged with, that we become a part of that family. I was with a pastor this week that I asked a question to. I asked him what was hard for him. And he told me that what was very hard for him is there was someone I knew in his church that I hadn't seen in many years in another town. And so I just asked him about that person. He said, well, you know, a few years ago, they decided that there was a better place for them than being here. And so they just left. And he says, you know, this, was a, this is a young man. He's, he's about 40. He said, that's probably one of the hardest things for me as a pastor. And I want to tell you this. I'm not, I'm not telling you this today because I, I, I want to uh, be unhealthy. But for a pastor, I can't tell you how many times through the years of being a pastor and from listening to other pastors, this is what people sometimes will tell you. We sure love you. We love our church, but we've decided we want to do something different. And we may decide to come back, but we might not. I'm going to tell you something. Being a pastor, you feel like you've been divorced a thousand times if you really love people. Now, I'm telling you that I also don't want to try to put a guilt trip on anybody because there are seasons. And there are times that it's healthy for transition to come. So don't miss here what I'm saying to you. What I am saying to you is that is totally a good thing if people are living very biblically based lives in the decisions they make and there's biblical basis for the decisions they make. Here's the challenge we have in America. We are a consumer driven culture. I actually went to both Myers and Kroger this week. I didn't tell the manager of Kroger's I'd already been to Myers. I didn't go to Walmart this week, so I wasn't too bad. I am not loyal to Myers because nobody at Myers died on the cross for me. And nobody at Kroger died on the cross for me. And I go there because I am buying things that we consume. And it kind of is smart to go get the things that you get the best deal on, isn't it? So being a consumer is not a bad thing. It's when that becomes a way of life instead of a part of how we're practical in our business experience. So church is not groceries. You do get fed in church. It is about 
things that churches offer, of opportunities. But at the end of the day, we are family. I have family members that are different. I have some family members that I am closer to than others. But they're still family. And I've been around other families, and the thought has crossed my mind before, I think I'll just quit my family and go be part of this family. I like what they do. But would I ever do that? No. Because I'm called to my family by birth for me, or possibly by adoption for some folks. We've been adopted into God's family, and he places us in local expressions of that family, and that's what LifeBridge is. We're a local expression. There are wonderful other churches. A dear friend to me is just around the corner from us, Ron Williams at Pathway. I love Ron. He's a great pastor. It's a great church. And there's a great family there. But God called me to LifeBridge and he's called us as a family. And it's important that we live in wisdom where we get anchored so that we don't look at church as who's got the best deal going this week. Knowing that, yes, there may be a point at which a season end will come, that there's a reason that we sense that, so we make a change. I want to make sure you hear this today, that I'm not just saying, then if you're here, you're stuck. It's not it. What I am saying is that you look and stay in a season until God says now there's a new season. And if you do that, it will cause you to live a stable Christian life. I'm so glad that we have online church. I'm I'm thankful for all of you who are part of the online family and those of you who We're here probably last Sunday or maybe two weeks ago, but for whatever reason, you couldn't be here in person today, but you're online with us because that's part of family. But one of the challenges we have in our culture is social media makes it easy to disconnect personally and have what can become more of a pseudo relationship because we don't have this contact of face to face and being able to hug someone's neck or shake someone's hand. And we need both. So I am thankful that we have the ability, and those of you who are online with us all the time, because that's the only way that it makes sense for you to have access, I don't want you to feel bad about that for a minute. But I want us to recognize it's all family and that's what becomes important. And wisdom and walking in wisdom will happen in the best place for us if we're connected to a full gospel biblical community that has a worldview based on the Word of God. Still love me? Next thing that's important is to build strong relational connection with wise mentors. Proverbs 13, verse 20. If you want to grow in wisdom, spend time with the wise. Walk with the wicked and you'll eventually become just like them. Need to evaluate the relationships in your life. The people that are having influence in your life, is it the kind of influence that you want in your life? Have you ever spent a lot of time around someone who's really negative? Have you ever noticed after you spend a day with them, you feel kind of uh, bummed? Why is that? Because negativity has a way of rubbing off. Who are the people you're associating with? Are there people who tear you down? Are there people who aren't your parents that try to parent you? Are there people who criticize every decision you make? Evaluate the relationships in your life because it's important that you have solid relational connection and that you prioritize relationship with a mentor or probably mentors who challenge you to go deeper. Who are the people that become mentors in your life that you look up to because you recognize that they have gained wisdom from what they've walked in life and and you want to walk in that kind of wisdom. Knowing this, that mentors are not perfect. 
they're still human. But if they're searching and seeking to please God, you look past sometimes things that may be some flaws as long as there's a greater sense of character and integrity that's far greater than whatever the flaws are. And then they can still work in your life to be a mentor. And so here's really what relationships should be like. And this is where wisdom comes. Engage in practices and disciplines where you are mentored. In other words, make it intentional. Don't just talk about it. But actually make room so that you have space for those people to be in your life. And it may be in multiple roles that you have those people who become mentors in your life. A dear friend to me has become in, in these last number of years my dear friend George. George Klein, who's a hero. I can't remember. I think George is either 85 or 86. Lives in Colorado. This morning I'm getting ready for church and all of a sudden a text message pops up from George Klein. And he did a, a FaceTime, I guess. It, he did some kind of a video with me by text. And there is George with his headphones in front of his microphone getting ready to do what he does every Sunday morning, a small radio station there where he lives in Colorado. He basically is a disc jockey, plays Christian music for a period of time every Sunday morning at that station, and then makes commentary about the goodness of God. George doesn't understand retirement. You need to know this. George has had serious heart issues, heart attacks, bypass surgery. He's a diabetic that requires injection of insulin every day. And yet he still travels all over the world doing missions ministry for the Foursquare Church. And he's still busy training other missionaries how to do what they need to do when they go out on the mission field to build a community of support around them. And he was basically sending me this message. He said, good morning, Bill. I miss you. I really want to talk to you and just catch up. I know you got a lot going on, but I want to talk to you and see how you're doing. I know you're going to preach this morning. God bless you. Have a wonderful morning. Made my day. He's a, he's a mentor to me. I trust George. I would ask his wisdom on something I was going to do. We need those people in our lives. And then we need to not just be mentored. We need to have people that we're taking the journey with. Who are the people that are closely in your life that are committed to the same values that you're committed to, that hold the same truth that you hold dear? May not be identical in every way, probably not, but the common ground is so strong that you can do life together and you learn from them and they learn from you. Iron sharpens iron. You need those relationships. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're married, I pray that God lets you have that relationship with your spouse. I cannot tell you how valuable it is to me to be married to a woman who's not afraid to tell me what she thinks. And I'm not afraid to tell her what I think. And you may find this as a great shock. We don't always agree on everything. But we all come to common ground and she and I have developed relationship that's so important to both of us and yet we give each other the freedom to explore the things that are available to us that are outside just the window of our relationship but because they become a part of it they make our relationship even stronger even greater and we need those kind of relationships we need friends like that within our lives we need connection within our lives with family and friends and then there needs to be people you are mentoring. I'll never forget when Jim Scott, who was the head of Foursquare Missions for a number of years, was here in our church one Sunday. And uh, this was well over a decade ago, probably 15 years ago. And we were at lunch after church that day, and Jim said to me, so tell me the young adults you're mentoring. And I said, well, 
we have a young adult ministry here at the church and at that point we had a really strong young adult ministry and I said uh, they're doing this and this and this and then we have youth ministry that's doing this and this. he said that isn't what I ask you he said who is a young adult that you are personally mentoring and I was kind because he was part of the leadership of Foursquare. But on the inside, I was really ticked. I thought, who do you think you are, Jim Scott? And what right do you think you have to even ask me that question? And it bugged me. But I want to tell you something. It changed a whole lot. Changed so much that by the time we went through a season where Pastor Grace and I had a time that we were leading our teenagers, I was now ready to say, what can I do to be in their lives? And I love those teenagers. Still love them. I'm thankful for Pastor Joe and Becca and what they're doing and for the next chapters we're moving into. But I still have relationship and there's still young people that I want to be a mentor in their lives. And I'm going to ask some of you, who are you mentoring that's a young adult or a kid? Well, I don't know that I know any and I just don't know where I'd meet them. Well, here's a good thought. Maybe you should approach Pastor Joe and Becca and see, would you potentially be a candidate to help minister and mentor to teenagers? Maybe what you could do, if it's a fit, I'm not saying if it isn't a fit, if it's a fit, maybe you could give up your Sunday evenings and come help be a help to them with the youth. Now, if you do that, don't come in thinking you know everything for the kids to learn from you. You're going to learn more from the kids than they learn from you. Trust me. Come be willing to learn, but then be willing to be a mentor. And Pastor Joe and Becca can show you how. It's time some of us get off our blessed assurance and get involved in places that make us uncomfortable because there are people who need to be mentored with a life experience that you have. Do you still love me? It's important to develop an effective prayer life. Jeremiah 33, 3 is one of my favorite verses. Ask me and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. Something you want to know about? Have you asked God about it? Ask Him. James 1, 5. And if anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom and he will give it. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. Most wise old people are wise because when they were young, they made a lot of mistakes that they learned from. What are you doing to actually develop a life where you talk to God, but more importantly, God talks to you? Several components of this, and, and you could spend hours on this, but let me just touch lightly. The first thing is fin spending time <clears throat> in meditation and communion with God. Just reflecting on God, reflecting on His goodness, reflecting on what He's doing in your life. Time that you just enjoy being together. I'm going to tell you, one of the highlights of my life doesn't happen every morning, but a lot of mornings, early in the morning, Grace and I will sit down and have coffee together. And I can't tell you what a fulfilling thing that is for me to just have opportunity. And most of the time, we don't have any agenda when we do it other than we're just going to be together and we're going to spend some time together. And sometimes some profound things come out of those conversations. And sometimes it's just a good time that we are together. 
but it's communion with my wife. When's the last time you had coffee with God? Where you just had communion? It may be that, that some form of worship music inspires you. Uh, one that right now is a present thing for me. There's a lot of different worship music that I enjoy. But I've really come to have great appreciation for Charity Gale and what she does when she sings worship. It's just a great spirit for me personally to engage in. And so meditation and communion become a part of your prayer life. Then there's the prayer that you pray for God to give you discernment. How do you know what to do? Well, a lot of us just stumble through the day and do whatever comes in front of us. How much better it would be if we really trusted and believed God would give us discernment for whatever it is we're doing and whatever we're involved in. That you would know this is what to do and that you don't do things until you know. That you let God show you before you step out on things and you develop discernment and then you also intercede over the things that need to change. Sometimes there's mountains that you can't move yourself. But your prayer in faith, your intercession regarding whatever it is, will move the mountain. It's amazing when you look and see how faithful God is and how God takes obstacles out of the path, how God straightens what seems so crooked before and he makes clear what seemed hazy before when we begin to intercede and ask. And then we trust that out of that, he's going to give us direction. And not only is he going to give us direction, but he's going to help us navigate. I tell you, I need that from God. Because frequently, I do like community. And frequently, if I'm driving, I'm in community with whoever I'm in the car with. Because I'm talking. And I have been known to pay more attention to the conversation than to the road when I'm driving. I, I'm sure I scared Pastor Joe to death this week in one instance. But the people slowed down when I pulled out in front of them. And we had a little communion with the person. But you know what? God protects us. Doesn't mean we shouldn't use more wisdom than we sometimes use. But God is going to give you a sense of direction for what he wants you to be doing. And then he's going to help you navigate what it is. Because generally where God gives you direction is going to take you into some places you can't do yourself. It's going to take you through paths that may not be totally clear, but as you're going through them, they begin to get clear because God's going to navigate the path for you. So what he's calling you to do is walk the path, trust him, and navigate it. So it's very important that if we're going to have a wise life, we have an effective prayer life. That we're grounded deeply into the word of God. James 1.22 Don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it, for that is the essence of self-deception. Always let his word become like poetry written and fulfilled by your life. I I preach a lot about this. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this this morning. But we've got to learn to experience appreciation for both the Logos or written Word of God because that written Word of God is the wisdom to live life. It's all given by inspiration. and It's given for us to have wisdom of how to live life. What's even neater is when something that's in that Logos word suddenly comes alive for whatever it is you're facing right now and it becomes a rhema word. It becomes a living expression from God that gives you clarity of how to live. And then there needs to be a strong cognitive awareness of the living word. You can never forget this. We talk about the word of God. Yes, the Bible is the word of God. Yes, it's important you read your Bible. But to know this, don't ever forget that Jesus is the living Word of God. 
And Jesus is inside of you. The Word of God is actually inside of you. And it's going to give you insight and illumination for the obvious path and journey. It ties right together with what we said about prayer. And then become fully immersed in the Holy Spirit. If you're going to live a wise life, you're going to need that. John 4, 14. If anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never be thirsty again. For when you drink the water I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit flooding you with endless life. Jesus told his disciples, listen, I'm sending you the perfect counselor, teacher, guide, the person of the Holy Spirit. It's important to understand this. You are organically connected to the source the Holy Spirit is not just out here the Holy Spirit is in you if you're a believer the minute Jesus comes into your heart the Holy Spirit is inside of you what God wants us to do is to become immersed in the Holy Spirit become saturated with the Holy Spirit so that literally the Holy Spirit is so consuming to you That you begin to recognize, oh, the reason I can live for God, the reason I have desire to live for God, the reason things work for me in my life is because I have this fountain on the inside of me that is bubbling up the life of God and bubbles out of me. And that is what it means to be baptized and immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit. The issue is not tongues. The issue is God saturate me. If that'll be your prayer, God will work the tongues thing out. We, we struggle with that on both sides of the fence, the people who believe in it and the people who don't, because we make that the focal point instead of understanding it's an evidence. The focal point is the fountain that's inside of you. Live from the fountain. And then live an intentional wisdom-driven life. Proverbs 19, 8. Do yourself a favor and love wisdom. Learn all you can, then watch your life flourish and prosper. It's so important to understand this. We talk about righteousness and living a righteous life. And I think so many times, because it's hard for us to conceptualize things without tagging them the way we see them. And, And boy, this has been so true in a lot of the church world. The word righteousness, we tag to behaviors. Are we tagged to things that you do do and things you don't do? So in other words, if you're righteous, then I don't cuss and I don't chew and I don't run with the boys that do. That's righteousness. No. I've met a lot of people like that who are just prideful people that I don't even like. And I'm not sure God cares much for their unrighteousness that they're making a cloak of their own righteousness. Self-righteousness. Here's true righteousness. True righteousness means wholeness. To be whole, to be complete. What God wants is for you and I to be complete in Him. Spirit, soul, and body. So that we're, our lives can be driven by His wisdom because we are so caught in who He is. And then what God wants us to live a life is this. Miracles are definitely a part of what God does and He still does miracles today. But I want to contend something to you this morning that if you learn to begin to walk in wisdom, I believe this is part of what transformation does in us as believers. I believe God wants us to, as we grow in Him, shift from the essential nature of needing miracles to survive to learning how to walk in His favor as a way of life. The more you learn how to live in his favor, the less you'll need miracles because his favor will lead you in paths that produce the fullness of who he has and who he is so that you're not having to worry about, oh God, can you bail me out of this? Because God's going to teach you how to do that. When I was young and I struggled to tithe and I struggled to give, I had to believe for miracles all the time financially. As I begin to learn in my finances to practice the stewardship of God, guess what happened? I have had less actual amazing miracles, and I've had some amazing miracles financially in my past, 
But I've got to tell you, the favor of God produces sufficiency and abundance. And that's true not just in money. That's true in every part of our life. I don't turn down any miracles that happen. But I want to live in such a way that I'm walking in the fullness of God that has His favor and that I'm not living so on the edge away from God that I need a miracle to pull me back to the right side all the time. Make sense? It's what God wants us to learn. So that we literally embrace daily walking in the wisdom of God. Keys, prayer, word, Holy Spirit. And then you're going to be able to live that intentional, wisdom-driven life. I met with some church leadership this week as a part of my assignment in our region. In the course of that conversation, we were discussing some financial issues related to the church. We were in a Zoom conversation. I just simply asked the question, so who sets the budget for your church every year. And because it was Zoom, I saw them looking at each other. And a minute someone said, well, she pointed to another person at the end of every year tells us how much money we took in and how much money we spent. I said, I didn't want to ask you. I said, who budgets your money? Well, you know, we don't have a lot of money to start with. And it doesn't always come in the same every week. Sometimes we have, we have a big amount that comes in sometimes once a year. We have others that come in different times. And so it's all over the place how it comes in. And I thought, they don't get it. And they're struggling. And here's what they don't understand. If you're going to have success as an individual, as a church, in business, you have to operate with the principle of God's Word on stewardship. And the reason a church needs a budget, this church has a budget every year that we operate with, is because it's a way of us being able to look and see how has God historically provided through the years. So what do we believe is somewhat predictable for us to plan how we move forward with this year? But also know that we've experienced growth and there's times that there's been increase. And so we make room that if increase comes, that we are able to do more than we've done before so that we can look at growth that happens. But we have a practical plan of action that we're going to take in how we manage the resources of this church. I promise you, if that church learns to do that, I'll have a different conversation with them three years from now. Because it's just what happens when you begin to operate in principles of God's wisdom. And if I don't get fired, they're going to have a budget in three years if I have anything to say. We need to live with God's principles for stewardship in every part of our life. It's very simple. Let me just hit them again as the highlights. Anchor in a full gospel, biblical worldview community or church. Build strong relational connection with wise mentors. Develop an effective prayer life. Ground deeply into the Word of God. Become fully immersed in the Holy Spirit. And live an intentional, wisdom-driven life. Pretty simple, isn't it? And when we do that, You know what will happen? We'll begin to walk in wisdom. Are you going to blow it somewhere? Absolutely. I had not done this in a long time. Come on, pastor. Be more positive with us. I'm positive you're going to absolutely blow it somewhere. But you'll be back on track if you'll live with a determination to walk in God's wisdom and then practice it. Let's grow into everything God's called us to be. Maybe you've walked in today. You're in this service. You don't really know Jesus. Maybe you're online with us today and you you don't know him personally. Today's the day to start this journey of wisdom. I want to pray a simple prayer and invite you to pray it with me. As we pray this prayer, literally Jesus is going to come into your heart. So if you're in the room with me right now, 
I just want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. You'd say, Pastor, I, I don't really know Jesus, but I'd like to. Would you just slip up your hand and hold it for a minute so I can see it and see who I'm praying with this morning? Thank you. Online, pray with me. In the room, everyone pray this prayer as affirmation for those who may be praying it for the first time today. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Forgive my sins. Give me eternal life. I receive you now. Amen.